Oh, I just been informed. Forgive me. There we go. We're live now. I'm going to go ahead and take this off of here. Uh, there we go. All right. So we're going to disregard. Shalom to everyone. I was actually getting sound and everything ready uh, to give you uh, today's information. I won't be before you long. Uh, there's going to be a slight delay that you just seen because I had the sound muted. And uh, of course, as usual, there was a problem with sound that I had to override and deal with. But we're here now. I want to say shalom to you. I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank everyone who's here to grow, uh, here to be fed and to be taught truth that can be challenged. And I thank everyone for tuning in. However, as I'm going to reiterate, as the, before the sun was on, I'm going to reiterate what I just said uh, as the sound. So if you experienced me seeing my mouth moving and did not hear any sound coming out, it was not it was not your devices. It was un, not unmuting the system for delivery. Um, that may have been for a purpose, for a reason. Uh, that I had to believe that Yeshua was silencing my mouth and giving me an opportunity to redo what I was saying because it was very uh, personal. And I have to be careful not to release anything that is personal but is purposeful. So thank everyone for tuning in. If you are here for the reasons to grow, um, then I engage you at a higher level and say shalom to you and stay stay tuned if you are here uh, for any other reason i invite you to go i am not here to answer questions about the integrity of why i do what i do throughout my life i'm not here to become the person that you allow to sit in this seat i'm not here for you to decide whether or not I have the option or the liberty or the right to speak on behalf of Yeshua HaMashiach. I'm here to do what I'm called to do. And for whatever reason that you may feel that that is not why I should be here, then I invite you to find someone who has the ability to speak accurately, harmoniously, directly, and in a Kairos fashion into your life. This will not become a situation to where pastorally I am being navigated based upon the emotions, the will, or the desire of listeners and viewers. Um, I must follow the hand of Yahweh. Not just here, but in every area of my life in my personal life, in my professional life, I expect to be challenged. This is what you should do to every person that speaks into your life. You should expect to be challenged. If you are a leader who cannot uh, deal with being challenged, then you are a dictator. Then you are not a leader. You are a loiterer. And you are stuck on the platform that you deny people the right to challenge you. And, and, and ideas should be challenged. Everything that I speak, everything that I say, everything that I do has the right to be challenged. Um, however, my integrity, I will not stand to be challenged. And if you don't know what I'm speaking of, and if you're not one who's challenging the, um, the, the reasons why I'm doing all that I do, then just stand by and listen to this. If you are a person who feels the need to inundate me anonymously or in person to verify my integrity, well, let me tell you, first EP Samuel 1 and 1 says, go kick rocks with no socks on. Yeah, this isn't church. This isn't your building where you pay your tithes or your offerings. This isn't even, 
anything close to it. I will not. We have been in the dark for far too long to allow this process to be inundated with people who simply want to control the narrative. Not here, not now, not ever. No, 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 no. So today we're going to do something a little bit differently. I want to first speak that uh, if you have indeed uh, pushed back only for a couple days the sending of the um, of the scriptures of the of the unabridged scriptures as I call them, uh, I did hesitate to send those out. I did push them back only for a few days. They are going out. Uh, they are supposed to. You, you are supposed to get your acknowledgement on. On the, in the midweek of, of this week. However, because I kept getting um, more requests, I wanted to make sure that I'm sending them out at one time so that I am not being hit with all kinds of taxes and charges to send them out separately. Those of you who ship and have been receiving shipment, you understand what I'm talking about. So all, all there's a few that are left. Um, for this first order and the second order again will be in the mid or the latter part of August but if you have please expect to receive that same email it's just simply now there's going to be several ways that you're going to be able to pay for those uh, I thought about it long and hard uh, about just this first shipment just giving them all away um, and taking and just making it an offering or an opportunity to sow into people's lives, but no, not going to do that. I sow on a regular basis. Um, I give into people's lives on a regular basis more than, um, I think more than what I should. And I know that may sound, I know that may sound crazy, but uh, um, um, tell me to turn that information down. I know that may sound crazy, but the reality is that when you are a giver, and those of you who understand what that is, and you give, give, give of yourself, you have to be careful that you are not giving away substance that is meant for your life. Um, because the day will come, and if you have not experienced it, you will experience it, that even though you may give at a high level of yourself, uh, you're going to be challenged that you're not giving enough or you're not doing enough or that you may be uh, taking advantage of people. Uh, and to the core, if you have not experienced it, it will, it will rattle you. So with this situation, the first shipment of orders, I was actually going to take the cost up on myself. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to allow each individual to sow from their life a seed. Uh, that does not mean that I am making any, um, I'm getting emails right now from individuals, uh, text messages right now about ordering process. Shalom, I, I, I see you. I, 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 I do recognize you. And yes, you will be on that order as well. That will be shipped out on the, on the second day of next week. Uh, but back to what I was saying is that I'm going to allow people the opportunity to sell. And um, I have moved carefully and cautiously through this process not to be perceived as unintegrous or not to be perceived as another pastor. No, I'm not another pastor. That's a title that I rescinded because I understood that I must be much more to this earth than just pastoral rabbinical, um, prophetic, a person, everyday people, EP is what I needed to be. And I've, I've, I've treaded carefully because I didn't want people to believe that. I wanted people to feel comfortable with my approach, even to my counseling, even to my therapy. I removed titles that I have earned in academia. Uh, I, I, I the, the Titles and positions and status that I have earned through training and developing. Um, I removed those titles because I wanted people to feel comfortable in knowing that they're getting an EP, an everyday person, versus uh, someone who's touting a position or a suffix or letters behind their name. Even in my practice, even in my um, 
counseling and therapeutic practice, uh, I've removed everything that looks like general everyday counseling and practice so that people can be comfortable with their approach so they can know they're getting the real person knowing that full well that if necessary I, I have the same credentials if not more than many people who are out and this isn't about me but the reason why I remove all those titles and tags is to make people feel comfortable and I think I did that so much to the detriment of this process but I'm retracking a little bit to make it very clear that I'm not going to take away the opportunity of people to be able to uh, to glean from their life, to glean from my life. One thing, if you've ever heard me say, I've said it a million times. If not, I'm going to try to say it a million times before I leave this earth so that it stands for a million years. Never take something in your life that does not cost you something. Never take something in your life that does not cost you something. Even if that sounds self-aggrandizing, because the minute that you do, then you can you will find yourself treating it like trash or you will find yourself requiring things from it that are unreal or ahead of its time. So as much as I wanted to, um, as much as I wanted to just pay for this and do this, I have a family to feed. I have responsibilities. And if Yeshua, as I, as I checked long and hard, I found out that Yeshua HaMashiach never told me to sow this seed into the life of people in this, throughout this giving of this first scripture. It cost me to get this. Not only that, it cost me to deliver this information, which I'm not charging for, which I'm not church, churchianity charging for. There's no collection bucket that goes around. Many will be amazed that of during this pandemic period, uh, that the expenses that I have reduced and have sold into the lives of people for free or for below cost, that have cost me major, major portions and percentages of my income. So I have to be obedient to Yeshua to make sure that I am making sure that as much as I'm being responsible to delivering this, these words of life, truth, and unveiling truth, I also have to make sure that I am being responsible to the life of my family. This is not a rich, get rich, quick, quick scheme and nothing that I do. It costs me much more than I receive, so much more. So as I was going to release these volumes of these scriptures to people for free of charge, that's really why no one on that first list, and you know who you are, uh, did not receive any emails this week. It's because I was contemplating uh, delivering them for free, the shipping, the handling, the cost, the whole nine. No, I'm going to stay with the first position and make sure that you will receive an invoice. Um, you re start receiving invoices. Actually, I'll make sure, uh, and please hold me to this word, um, by the second day, which would be Monday of this week, I will work feverishly to get every single one of them out. And I'm asking that all invoices, I'm not going to go back and go through each one and make sure they're paid. Um, I'm going to trust that those on the on that first shipment order list I'm going to send you the invoice and on when what is known as Wednesday, those of you who know why I hesitate to say Wednesday is is because Wednesday, you know what that is if you've been a part of the Sabbath at seven. Um, but it will be by the midweek of part of this week, I will be shipping them out so you should receive them throughout as they're coming from the south. Uh, the, the southeast expect them to be delivered by to the midwest um, in three to five days if you are ones who have been um, are on the west coast and please expect seven to ten days for delivery it should not take that long but i don't know um, how your mailing system is ran i will be delivering them uh, united states postal service 
So please be aware of those. They may come by UPS. They may come. Excuse me. They, it may come by Prime, Amazon Prime. It depends on the you know the you, you, the United States Post Office is using Prime to deliver some of the products. So be aware of that coming to your doorstep. The price is thirty dollars, and that includes shipping. And that includes the cost of, of the scripture. And this is the first of, of probably I have a list. And today you're going to see a couple of other books that I don't want you to buy them. You can. You can do whatever you want to do, whomever you are. But I don't want you to go out and buy the books that you're going to see in today's video. Because if you, I will give special offers to subscribe to a online service that I'm going to begin to offer that will allow you um, to have access to all all rabbinical teachings, which will always remain free. But you will also be able to receive. Uh, someone just asked, "No, I'm not Jewish. I'm Hebrew. Um, no, I'm not uh, Islamic. I am Hebrew. Um, no, I did not convert to Judaism. I am Hebrew. Okay." Um, so there will be also a, a process that I will be engaging people on that will have uh, greater information, that will have uh, daily information. I'm feeling like there may be a shift uh, because I will make sure that information comes out, that I will spend time um, delivering information on a platform to where it's streaming, it's live. Uh, if I feel the need to record in the middle of the day, or to release information or interviews from going somewhere to speak to someone or I have a private conversation with 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 someone and they're coming I have many people that I want to introduce to this process especially when it comes to understanding the role of slavery on this side of the United States soil uh, post uh, 18 1800s yes I'm going to deliver everything that comes pre 1860s, but I will be engaging people to who are experts and have great knowledge on things that have happened in the U.S. to get you ready to understand the Hebrew history of the United States and the Hebrew history from a historical standpoint and from a spiritual standpoint. So I'll be doing those type of interviews and doing things like that with people. And I'm going to offer that on a separate platform that I'm working very hard to accomplish. But of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm doing all, all of this myself, not able to really engage a team um, because of the pandemic and things like that. But I have recognized that under in, in my own area um, that um, that my wife is a very studied and learned person who is engaging herself more and more and, and coming up with phenomenal information on covering things as a historian in her own right. And I'm going to lean on her to help me with this process more. I'm also going to lean and depend on my mother, who also uh, who is a, is a learned person who is growing uh, and learning so much in her own right. Um, but I'm going to lean and depend on these individuals to make sure that I'm able to get ready for this new platform. How many of you all know that even the churches that you have attended and still attend, that is majorly not only funded, but but ran, have been ran and have been stabilized by strong Hebrew women. That's the truth. That's the utmost truth. A lot of these men would not be great. I'm talking from Malcolm to to I'm talking to Martin to Malcolm to to uh, um, um, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, those are the ones that, that would not even be great if they didn't have support of the, these black, beautiful Hebrew women in their life uh, who gathered information, who did the dirty work, who 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 stayed at the churches, who cleaned the churches. It was the women. It was the black Hebrew women who bolstered the life of the black Hebrew man when he was under attack from the very beginning of time in this country. And it still stands to this day. So I'm going to depend and lean on those individuals. We are also I'm also in the process of putting together a black national registry of businesses and rating systems and 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 our own trade information, trading and and, and doing business around the country. It's a lot that's going on and I'm building that platform. Um, 
and I thank everyone who continues to pray for my health. I'm doing a lot better. Um, I've taken a lot of time over the past several weeks to deal with a couple of things, and I don't want to get off track here, but I'm going to go back to the Bible in a minute. Um, but I thank those who have been praying for me. I'm doing better health-wise. I've still got a long way to go. Um, not ashamed to talk about I deal with uh, very, a pretty serious edema. And, it, it, and those who know about edema, it's just not iron. It's the effects that it can have on your heart, your cardiovascular system, your red blood cell count. Uh, there is a bomb in Gilead, and it is healing. And I'm not just sitting around shuckle bucking and hucking. Ha ya ya ya! Your boy is, is 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 hitting the weights and 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 making sure that I'm returning to a stature that I'm not giving the opportunity to go down, but to press back up. And so I've been taking a lot of time. I've not been able to explain to a lot of people, but I uh, I think it's time to do that now. That the reason for a lot of my inability to maneuver over really over the past two months me forcing myself is because I've been dealing with this health issue that pretty much renders me has rendered me helpless and mo mo motionless um, but here I am here I am and today I feel the best I have felt in a long time uh, but trying to explain to people uh, who, have, who, have, who have expectations of your greatness is hard especially when to ask for grace doesn't generally happen. Um, but I'm here, and I'm forging forward, and I feel good about it. Uh, and I feel good in my spirit. I feel good in my body. I've been eating good. I've been eating right. Um, I've been engaging in activities to try to get myself in a better place, and it's working, and it's doing well. Um, I'm happy to successfully report that uh, even, you know, relationships, even my, my, my wife and I have are really working hard to advance our relationship so that it does not play a part, uh, and not just for my health, but for our health, so that we can be more to this world at a different level. Or well, sometimes you got to speak a thing. Sometimes you got to speak a thing. Um, so I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Am I looking okay? Looking okay. I actually shaved my beard and give and got a I got a proper haircut and, and and made myself look good. I even covered some of that gray up underneath there. Uh, I'm uh, working on that. Well, I'm working on the building. But back to the scriptures. They will be sent out this week. Uh, there's nothing that's holding that up. I'm very very excited about getting those to your hands. But the platform that's being built will be. Don't purchase the books that you're going to hear about and see today. If you want to, you can, but I'm telling you that I'm in, in conversations uh, with the individuals and, 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 and publishing companies to get a certain amount of those books that, that I will speak to you about in stock. As a matter of fact, even study material, Hebrew material that we'll be going over, I will be engaging people to on, on the private platform to teach Hebrew, to teach knowledge that your churches have never done, never have done. And you need to tell someone about it. Yeah, I know you've never heard me say that before. Uh, but you need to tell someone about it that deserves to be a part of this remnant, this activity. Because it is going to be different. Not church, churchianity. This is truth. We will cover everything from why it's important for you to know prophetically, spiritually, uh, phonetically, historically, who you are on many levels and it will be many people on this platform that I will engage to get you there. So do not buy the books that you see. Understand that there will be opportunities to 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 literally to get training material, books, uh, and, and and even material more materials that if you are able to sign up for the new service that will be only uh, we're working on right now to keeping the service to only six ninety nine to nine ninety nine a month, you're going to receive yeah, I, I said pay. I did. I said pay because it's going to cost me more money to get the materials in and to gain enough exposure so that the books that may cost you. I'm not talking about selling you material that you won't need. Um, I'm, not about, I'm not making merchandise of people. I'm not answering those questions anymore. I'm not answering those questions anymore. If you're going out and buying a book from Amazon for $24.99 and I'm supplying you with seven books plus that book in a five, six month period, and you're getting those free to your doorstep. There's no question 
But the problem is we got to stop looking at it from that standpoint and understand that what's coming to you is going to be worth the value of everything that you're going to be getting from this process. And if you don't want them, if you don't want to sign up for the service, that's perfectly fine. I'm not going to autom automatically push people out. No, you ask where the books are coming from. I'll tell you how to get them. And if you don't want to get this book or that book, it's not just books that we're going to be giving away. It's going to be materials. It's going to be, as we move closer to the feast, it will be invitations uh, to 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 join us in in the feast of Sukkot, the feast of booths as we get into that uh those type of things it will be uh you know different garments it would be different pieces that that will be meaningful to your hebrew existence that for generations you've been lacking and as i te text 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 myself or or or, or in, interpret myself to get more involved in understanding with people uh, and, I, and I meant to say test myself, I, I, that X got in there, uh, with people of different communities, of Hebrew communities, I will be bringing more portions in, um, discounts on how to observe the feast, uh, excuse me, not discounts on how to observe the feast, but discounts on where to go to get kosher foods and things of that nature. All these things are going to be necessary for you to understand training materials from the Hebrew context, historical books, historical documents that you will have for generations to come if Yahshua uh, withstays his, his, his coming to the earth. I'm no longer going to be afraid to embrace the totality of what I need to be to this earth. Opportunities are coming and, and you may ask even why a different platform? Well, if you understand anything, if you understand anything about, make sure you got my whole headshot in there. Make sure I'm not cut off and people. Okay, if you if if you understand much about this process, Facebook, uh, social media sites, at a whim, if they feel that anything that you're saying or doing may be controversial or goes against, uh, look what just happened to to Nick Cannon, wealthy man, on his own platform was released. I'm making sure that I'm on a platform that I cannot be censored or silenced. I have a family member who is on Facebook all the time, and man, he stays in Facebook jail for just putting stuff out there. So I'm building that platform so that it's my platform, and I cannot be censored or silenced, and you can receive the truth one way or the other. If they shut down the internet, I'm still going to be able to get it to your doorstep. I'm still going to be get it, be able to get it to you in writing. Let me say something about that. It's important that you receive this material not in digital form the scriptures the by the, the books you i don't want you to get it in digital form because if i own the ability to change the the digitization of the form then i can change a the to an uh and i can change a b to a c without your knowledge that's the problem with a lot of these translations that we're looking at that if you don't tangibly have it in front of you that cannot be rewritten on some on some digital screen. And there's the wrong with there's nothing wrong with digital. But I want to challenge you to understand that you gotta make sure you have these things in tangible form. If they shut down access to internet, and I say and I say if, and I'm I'm giving you a, a fair warning, censorship. If they shut it down, how are you gonna get it? You're gonna go to your phone? Digital. Your iPad? Digital. Amazon? Digital. I'm supplying you with material that has been hidden from you for a long time. I'm supplying you with information that I have been researching. And you're going to hear even this individual today talk about it. A lot of the stuff that even this learned, learned, even other learned people are discovering because it's time to be discovered. They that, that they're learning and have been engaged in only for a few years. But those of us who are supposed to be the gatekeepers to get this information out, it's coming in succession. It's coming in succession. If you feel like you can go and find it on your own, I'm not going to laugh at you. But internally, I'm going to say that, well, I'm not going to laugh. There's still an order that Yeshua has sent. And the information has been under the sun for a long time, but it's been undiscovered or uncovered. It is up to Yeshua to uncover it information to the eyes of those who are to teach and who are to arm people naturally and spiritually 
to be ready to understand where we are in this time. So today, uh, I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to be narrating on only only for a few minutes. I've been going for 38 minutes now. I'm only going to do about 25 minutes of narration, and this will be the last week. Understand that this will be the last week that I. The reason why I'm choosing to do it this way this week, and to and to do narration on information that deals with post slavery in the United States, is because if this this if this material makes you cringe, then you really should be very, very cautious proceeding forward. Because what I'm going to be delivering next, if you can challenge the authority of this information that is on this side of slavery in America, then you will find a very offensive to where I'm going to go, the things that I'm going to say, the things that I'm going to uncover. Um, I'm going to deal with starting next week the Kazarian and and the Kazarian and the Ashkenazi and and of the Ashkenazi people. I'm going to begin to deal with the the, the true reality of those who are currently inhabiting uh, the country or the space of Jerusalem and Israel. I'm also going to be uncovering prophetic truth of the uh, of the scripture that those who were the first wave will have their scriptures in their hands and will be able to see in plenteous form what I'm speaking of and how I'm going to connect uh, prophetic understandings from the Nabiums, which are the prophets, which from, from, from the Old Covenant to the Torah and begin to disseminate and break down that information on a whole different level. So it's the last week that I will do this. And I'm doing this because I want to narrate over what this gentleman is saying, just to prepare you uh, for what's going to be coming. Um, and I'm hoping to get in contact with Mr. Robinson very quickly here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reaching out to him and his people. Uh, what you're going to see today, in the next several minutes, you're going to see the ACLU Deputy Legal Legal de, de, Excuse me, the ACLU Deputy Legal Director and the director of the Trone Center for Justice and Equality. His name is Jeffrey Robinson, and what he's doing is he will be engaging a predominantly white group of individuals who have no knowledge of this historical information. These are, these are predominantly white individuals who, who are not racist, who do not claim to be racist and, and who have, have exhibited no signs of racism. And you're going to look at the looks. I want you to pay attention to the looks on their faces when they hear information. And the same look that they have on their face is the same look that I have, I, I, I see on the faces of black and brown people when they hear me speak about the true existence or the nat nature of the Hebrew. The same look the or the disbelief or uh, that's not true. The same look that you're going to see from these caucus, these Caucasian individuals who want to know, who have assembled in this place, not to say um, we already know this, but show us because we need to know. And I do this. The reason why I do this, excuse me, it's the same look that I see on the face of black and brown people who look around and say, ah, that's not true. Or I don't need to know that. Or I already knew that. Or. That can't be true. Here's why I take time to do this today. Those of you who don't know, only a few weeks ago, I'm shopping in the store and I'm I'm just literally being effective in how I deliver life to people in the middle of a store. And an unassuming uh, middle-aged white woman followed me out the store, got in her car, which made me a little nervous, uh, after I simply displayed love and affection towards people. And I made a comment about um, I made a comment about, I think I made a comment about um, we don't, what we need right now is more truth, understanding, and love, and less of tearing down the statues. The statues, and you, and you hear this gentleman say today, the te tearing down the statues is important because it, it, it makes the, it brings the realization that there is a problem. But when you realize that there, that, that there is a problem, there's going to be the need for teachers, rabbis of truth, 
to deliver naturally, historically, as this man will do, and someone like myself who will deal with the spiritual and the historical value of the change of the transformation. So she followed me outside and she gave of herself monetarily, not even knowing me, and said to me some very key things to me, not knowing me from Adam, not knowing me from the foundation of the earth. And seeing, hearing her say to me, thank you for being what you are. Continue to do what you're doing. It pushed me. And it even compelled me to, as 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 my mother brought this, 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 this TED talk or this documentary talk, this powerful talk that we're going to watch today, it compelled me to make sure that I am teaching from a heart of understanding and not just we are the people. So we're going to take a moment today and look at some of this footage. I'm going to stop the footage from time to time, only about 20 minutes of it. I will not be going through the whole thing. If if you are interested in my commentary or even overview of the entire process, I will be doing that uh, more tomorrow. And I will be recording that and releasing that in bits and pieces uh, during the week. I'm not sure how I'll do that yet, but just, be, just make sure you're subscribed to YouTube, um, the Yeshua Remnant, and you're also subscribed to Facebook as I will put those out there with my commentary around them, same as we'll do today, so that you have more of a personal feel of the information um, as we move forward. Let's get into it, shall we? Years ago, Muhammad Ali went to Great Britain, and he was interviewed about America, and he tried to talk about white supremacy with a little bit of humor. And I'd like you to listen to what he had to say. Things are getting much better, but I always wonder when I went to church on Sundays. I've always been one to, I'm not just a boxer. I do a lot of reading, a lot of studying, I ask questions, I go, I travel these countries, I watch how their people live, and I learn. And I always ask my mother, I say, Mother, how come is everything white? I said, why is Jesus white with blonde and blue eyes? Why is the Lord suffer all white men? Angels are white. Who? And the Mary and every, even the angels. I said, Mother, when we die, do we go to heaven? She said, naturally, we go to heaven. I said, well, what happened to all the black angels they took the pictures? <laughs> Now, what I want you to see, what I want you to focus on before we go any further, just this is how I'm going to do the commentary. Isn't it amazing how Muhammad Ali was, was demonized for the majority of his life until he became a no threat? The minute that he began to shake and, and they wanted to now iconicize him and they wanted to make him an icon the same way that they have done many of our our Hebrew leaders. But isn't it amazing that while now this is this is several decades ago, that they would not even show this material to show his diplomacy, his charisma. They wanted to show him as the big mouth shogun that that is. And I need you to be aware of that. I need you to be aware of that. And the leaders that are stepping up now, different from your churches and different from what you've seen as leadership. Don't let the powers that be demonize those who are supposed to be the releases of truth in your life. Let's keep going. I said, oh, I know. If the white folks was in heaven too, then the black angels. Oh, I think I was, I think I was muted there. Let me say that again. That isn't, um, and I apologize for that. I'm still getting the hang of some of this. Isn't it amazing how only a few decades ago, they demonized Muhammad Ali. Isn't it amazing how they said that he was he was the worst thing since 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 uh, foot older? And now, after his his death, and, and even after he uh, was shaking and 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 began to develop um, certain symptoms, he was a no threat anymore. Now they want to uh, 
uh, iconicize him, make him an icon. Unfortunately, that's how they do a lot of our leaders. Um, a lot of our black and brown leaders, uh, they will try to demonize demonize us so that we are of no support and no regret, excuse me, not regret, uh, of, of, of no no support and of no consequence to what we say to 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 uh, validate and bring people to a place of understanding. And now we're looking generations later, several generations later, several decades later, and we see how the words of Muhammad Ali were true then and they're true now, but he's not here to be the leader. What I'm saying is don't devalue the leadership that is up and coming now. Don't make them out to be more pastors. Don't make them out to be more, more civil rights as we've seen it. Allow myself and other leaders to become what they're supposed to be for your life, for this dispensation, without being um, molded and without being uh, confiscated into an arena where, where, they're t where you're told, don't listen to them. They're no good. Let's keep going. I had to die to go to heaven. Well, I couldn't have pretty cars and good money and nice homes now. Why do I have to wait till I die to get milk and honey? And I said, Mama, I don't want no milk and honey. I like steaks and, and I said, milk and honey is a laxative anyway. <laughs> do they have a lot of bathrooms in heaven? So anyway, I was always curious. I always wondered why, you know, tar Now I want you to watch the reaction of uh, and, and you'll see some brown skin sprinkled in between these people. But I want you to look at the reaction of these individuals, these white individuals, when when now Mar Malcolm is unassuming, he's not a threat, and they and they've and they've been taught how to accept him uh, after his death and even after all of the great things that he did to advance people. But I want you to watch their faces as it changes in only a few minutes when they hear about things that they knew nothing about. as the king of the jungle in Africa. He was white. <laughs> white man. I saw this white man swinging around Africa with a diaper on hollering. Oh, oh, oh. Do you all see Tarzan over here? Right. Tarzan? And all the Africans, so he's beating them up and breaking the lion's jaw. And here's Tarzan talking to the animals. And the Africans been there for centuries, and he yet can't talk to the animals. All the Tarzan <laughs> I always wonder why Miss America was always white. All the beautiful brown women in America, beautiful suntans, beauty shapes, all type complexions, but she always was white. And Miss World was always white. And Miss Universe was always white. And then they got some stuff called White House Cigars, White Swan Soap, King White Soap, White Cloud Tissue Paper, White Rain Hair Rinse, White Tornado Flow Wax. Everything was white. And the angel food cake was the white cake, and the devil food cake was the chocolate cake. <laughs> Now understand, there's roar of laughter. There's roaring laughter. Even look at her face, and there's roar of laughter. Even in the background where Muhammad Ali is speaking at, and the white food and, and the white angel cake, the white white angel food cake, and then you had devil food cake was brown. Not a coincidence. I need you to understand that this is the last time that I will say things like this this week before I delve into being very precise at delivering information. These are not coincidences. If, you, if you're one that has a problem with hearing that type of saying, no, it's on purpose. Blackmail. There's a reason why it's called blackmail. White lies. It's a reason why these things are there. These are not on accident. You need to understand this because if 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 they will go to and you're going to see this, if they will go to such great lengths to keep or to hide Confederacy and slavery on this side of the United States soil in order to keep history away from a people on this side of 1800, then what do you think they would do have done that you would deny that has happened? That has been taken away from your history that was before this time. Just keep 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 watching. I always wondered, you know, and, and the president lived in the White House. <laughs> and Mary had a little lamb, his feet as white as snow and snow white. And everything was white. Santa Claus was white. 
and everything bad was black. The little ugly duckling was a black duck, and the black cat was the bad luck. And if I threaten you, I'm gonna blackmail you. I said, Mama, why don't they call it white male? They lie too. I was always curious, and then, and this is when I knew something was wrong. <laughs> Won the Olympic gold medal in Rome, Italy. Olympic champion, the Russians standing right here, and the pole right here. Is Poland considered a communist country? Yeah. Yeah, I'm defeating America's so-called threats and enemies. And the flag is going, dun, 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 I'm standing so proud. Dun, dun, dun. And I don't hook the world of America. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. I took my gold medal, thought I'd invented something. I said, man, I know I'm going to get my people freedom there. I'm the champion of the whole world, Olympic champion. I know I can eat downtown now. And I went downtown that day, had my big old medal on and went to rest us. At that time, black things weren't integrated. The black folks couldn't eat downtown. And I went downtown and I sat down and I said, you know, a cup of coffee, a uh, hot dog. He said, the lady said, we don't serve Negroes. <laughs> I'm so mad. I said, I don't eat them either. Just give me a couple of <laughs> Now, I want you to see this. It's hilarious, and they can accept all these moments of, uh, and first of all, he didn't, I guarantee she didn't say Negro. But you see how they can laugh because we can accept the form of, 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 of humor to explain the past, but I want you to watch the, 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 the vast difference of the face when the truth comes and it's not shrouded with laughter or jokes. Olympic gold medal. And three days ago, I fought for this country in Rome. I won the gold medal, and I'm going to eat. The manager heard her tell the manager, and she says, he said, well, I'm not the, I'm not the man that he's got to go out. Anyway, I didn't raise money. They put me out. And I had to leave that restaurant in my hometown where I went to church and served in their Christianity and fought and daddy fought in all the wars. Just won the gold medal. They couldn't eat downtown. I said, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And this is a difficult topic and a difficult subject, in part because our history has been stolen from us. And it was done intentionally and purposefully. And when you are asking a human being to reject what they have been brought up with, what they have been taught by their parents as the truth, what they have seen in their schools and in their colleges and universities as the truth. When you're asking somebody to all of a sudden say, that's a lie, and the truth beneath that is really ugly, you're asking for somebody to do a really hard thing. Now, let me make a comment on that to you, the viewer. If, if it's going to be hard for Caucasian or white people to see this, then you better be you better be dang sure you Hebrew black brown person that it's going to be um, it's going to be just as hard for you, twice as hard for you, because not only will I be uh, engaging you or enhancing your understanding of your heritage. But I will also be tearing down constructs of your Christianity and your churchianity. If you thought this is going to be a cakewalk of just learning about the Hebrew, then, then you might as well buckle up. Because you've been lied to not only in universities and colleges, and even your and, and I don't care if you're older than I am. A lot of your pastors are younger than you, and you allow them to teach truth that you've never heard. You're going to find yourself challenged to the core, even what your mama and your daddy taught you. You're going to find yourself challenged to things that you've done as black people, as brown skinned people in religion that are completely false. If you can accept the truth 
of what you had to hard swallow hard behind pulpits, then you better batten down the hatches because this ain't going to be any easier. As a matter of fact, it'll be harder because you have never heard this type of truth. I'm talking about combining spirit with historical with, well, let's just continue. And I think it's important for us to remember that as we talk about these discussions. But a hard thing is where we are and a hard thing is what we have to do. Because everyone will remember George Orwell in 1984. And there are two things that come from that book that I will ask you to remember and to remember very carefully. First, who controls the past controls the future. Because if you control the narrative about what is true about our past, that narrative sets the mark for how we go forward in the future. If you control the truth about the past, then you have the path to the future. And who controls the present controls the past. We can laugh when our president and people in this administration say things about our communities and our history that we know are just not true, but people are listening. When the President of the United States, when cabinet members are talking to America about what is true and what it is right, it makes a difference. And when we do not deal with the ugly part of the truth about our history, we have no chance of going forward in any kind of productive way. So let me say this. <clears throat> you can take down every Confederate monument in America tomorrow. It ain't gonna feed anybody. It ain't gonna get anybody out of prison. It's not gonna put uh, good water into Flint, Michigan. It's not gonna solve all the racial problems we have in America. What getting rid of the Confederate monuments will do is, in my view, begin a process of making Americans like you and me, who were never taught the truth about our country, it will make us... Now understand this. Understand that he is speaking only from a historical standpoint in the United States. Understand that, people of Yeshua, that what is about to be uncovered through this outlet and others that are just like it is not just speaking of the United States or from a historical standpoint, but it is going to engage you to understand the spiritual, the supernatural, and the historical. I hope you're listening to me. What he's saying is strictly from a natural standpoint. A natural standpoint. What I'm getting ready to release is going to tie your existence to understand the truth that has been stolen from you. And it's not enough to be angry about it. It's, it's, it's going to be that you need to be engaged at such a level that you understand what your next moves need to be. Let's keep going with the truth, and that's a scary thing. Never underestimate the pull of the status quo. Because if we are really going to acknowledge what I'm gonna suggest to you is our true history in this country, it has implications. What does it mean about the wealth that I have? What does it mean about the comfort that I live in right now? What does it mean about the place I work at? even a place like the ACLU? What does it mean to examine how things got here today to be the way that they are? Those are very uncomfortable questions. And what I'm suggesting is we are at a tipping point. Either we deal with this or this will tear us apart. 
don't read this book. <laughs> Under no circumstances should you read this book. This book is about no. Drug abuse. He's being very he's being very serious about that. This is not a book that uh, is on a recommended reading list. He's using it for it's not like don't do it to do it to get you to do it. This is not a book that I will put on the reading list, and I will examine to you why in future days, but this is not something that you really necessarily need to put into your knowers because it is it is finite trash. In that book, you do not want bouncing around in your head late at night when you're trying to go to bed. Don't read this book, but do understand the title of this book because William Burroughs got the title for this book from one of his Beat Generation co co-workers and co-friends, Jack Kerouac. And when Burroughs was asked, what is naked lunch? What does that mean? Here's the answer that he gave. And that's what I'm gonna ask us to do tonight, to have a naked lunch moment with race in America, where we have to actually look at what is truly on the end of our fork. Because if we look at that, what we're gonna see is not very pretty. Do read this book. It is, has great examples of this how- This would be on the supply American reading list as well. Has used code words and dog whistles to hide our dependence on white supremacy. And I want to give you an example because I know you have heard in this entire debate, well, there's a difference between heritage and hate. And there's a difference between Southern culture and slavery. And the monuments are celebrating heritage. They're celebrating culture. They're celebrating Southern pride. And people have understood these code words for a long time and they were never explained better than by this man. Do you see the faces? Do you see the faces? Now, Mr. Robinson, who's presenting, has the task of doing this for a predominant Caucasian people to bring them to a place of acknowledgement. I understand that my task in the earth is to bring this information to predominantly brown society. The same face that you've seen that that last woman had is a face that I look upon every time I share information with people of color. In this audio, made public for the first time ever, Atwater lays out how Republicans can win the vote of racists without sounding racist themselves. I want you to pay attention to the language. I want you to pay attention to the language for this reason. The reason why I want you to pay attention to the language is, is, is because this is learned language that was, dis was descended upon the current people from the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. It was descended upon from for them by generations before them that did the same things, the same things that they're doing, but it was how to get the slaves over here. It was how to change their identity from Africa. It was how to make them misunderstand or lose the ramifications that they are the Hebrew. The same way the rhetoric that you're about to hear is the same language that was predicated or given to them by their forefathers of how to remove the understanding of who you are. It has not changed. The language may change. The verbiage may change, but the language has been passed down. Let's keep going. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, and now y'all are quoting me. I, 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 
you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts your backfire. So you say stuff like uh, force busing, states rights, and all that stuff. And you get so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things. And the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that, we, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger nigger, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. He said, either way you look at it, race is covered on the back burner. I want you to go back to what he said first, though. I want you to understand what what what, what he really said first. He said, "Don't you don't you y'all don't want to be quoting me right now? Why? This is inside information." He's telling how they went from saying epitaph epitaph. I'm not going to say that because that will be a red flag for Facebook and YouTube. He went from saying epitaph to epitaph to start to start to swing the lingo into tax cuts or things of that nature. They just changed the lingo to cover what they want to cover. He's giving inside information about how they handle this whole race thing. And he said, one way or another, race is going to be taken care of in all this talk. Any way you look at it, race is going to get put on the back burner. So don't say nigger, just say states' rights. Remember that as we talk about our history, because that man learned from what we have done in the past. People think that the South lost the Civil War. They lost the war, but they won the peace. And they won it by rewriting the history of our country. And that's what I'd like to talk about this evening some. So we have our president saying, the history and culture of our great country is being ripped apart by the removal of beautiful statues. You can't change history, but you can learn from it. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, who's next? Washington Jefferson. And it's so foolish, and also the beauty that is being taken out of our cities and towns will be greatly missed and never able to be comparably replaced. I have an easy way for you to think about this. George Washington owned slaves. He absolutely did. The Washington Monument, if you go to Washington, D.C. and look at it, it's got nothing to do with slavery or the Civil War on it anyway. I think what he was honored for was, I don't know, forming the country, <laughs> being the first president. And oh, by the way, he was not the first president. When you find out your history, you'll find out that there was actually a black man who served as president that they've erased from history. But we'll get to that when we get to more information in the weeks to come. Don't believe me. Check my integrity. Check, check, check your own sources and find out that there was a black president prior. There was a president before Washington. Just do a little homework. I promise you I will. I promise you I'll show you the truth. What you do with this is going to be up to you. Let's continue. The fact that he owned slaves, you are absolutely right, and I'm going to talk about that. But that monument is not a monument to fighting, killing others, and being willing to die yourself so that you can enslave people and treat them as chattel. That's the difference between the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Monuments and the monuments that I'm going to talk about. So, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. And what greets me as a citizen of Tennessee when I go to my state capital in Nashville where my grandparents lived? This is what I see. Nathan Bedford Forrest, 
And you can see Confederate States Army, Lieutenant General, and his birth date and his death date. There is nothing else on this monument except the fact that he was a Confederate States General. Well, he made a fortune in Memphis as a slave trader, and he was the original Grand Wizard of the KKK. He led a Confederate massacre of black soldiers and white soldiers, American soldiers, during the Civil War. And this monument wasn't put up in 1865 or 1866 with people saying he's such a hero, we have to recognize him. This monument was built in 1970. Did you hear that? These monuments that are being torn down have, are not monuments that have been up for 50, excuse me, 100 years. These are monuments that have been planted and put up after the Civil War. Why? Ask yourself why. Why? Because it sends the message, the subliminal messages of recognizing, making you and I both recognize. It, it, it may have, it may be the United States, but you will always remember that you are inferior. You will always be afraid to really to check on your history. You always remember that, as he said, the North won the war, but the South won the psychological battle. Two years after Martin Luther King was shot in the neck, just down the road from Nashville, Tennessee, That is the yearbook from Nathan Bedford Forest High School in Jacksonville, Florida. It's the most recent version that I could find from 1993. This is now called Westside High School in Jacksonville, Florida, and that name change occurred in 2014. Wait, wait, did you hear the response? Did you hear the rumbling and mumbling? To it, the, the yearbook said the Confederate in 1993. They didn't remove it to change the name of the school until 2014. Did you hear the grumblings? Did you hear it? I did. And if you're wondering what the Civil War was about, how about not listening to pundits from today or politicians from today, how about going back and listening to the people that actually fought that war and what they have to say? If we ain't fighting to keep slavery, then what the hell are we fighting for? I got uh, a couple of days ago an email from a gentleman who uh, sent me an article about the Robert E. Lee family because Robert E. Lee's descendants are still alive and in Virginia. And he said, I hope you understand that, you know, these descendants are not their ancestor. And I know you're going to give this talk, and I hope you will have in your mind and in your heart empathy, not sympathy, but empathy for his family today. And I want to say, could I just see a show of hands in this room? How many people in this room have ever owned a slave? I see no hands. Robert E. Lee's family, the people that exist today, they never owned slaves either. Slavery is not our fault. We have no responsibility for it. It is part of our shared history. And that's what we can't walk away from. And one of the I have no responsibility to make people feel comfortable about the fact that I understand where I'm, where I'm from. I don't have a responsibility to, to make people, white people and other people in this country to feel better about the fact that I, my people were sold into slavery. I don't have a responsibility to go back before the United States to make people feel okay with understanding that I know that, that my history was withheld and you have hidden the fact that I am the Hebrew and you are afraid to let me know that because you didn't want me to ascend to understanding 
and find out that you were not inferior, but you were not those people. I don't have a responsibility to make you comfortable. I don't have a responsibility scripturally or rabbinically to make you feel comfortable about this information. I have to deliver this. You don't have a responsibility to be timid about getting knowledge, about trying to make somebody become educated, or about spending time of feeling bad about, well, I've been at this church for 50 years, and I've been here, and I can't offend my, my religion history. You don't have a responsibility to false religion or false truth in order to make it feel better by the fact that you are coming into truth. Deny yourself that responsibility. Deny yourself that position. You are responsible for the stripes that were put onto your ancestors' backs. You are not responsible for the noses on, on sphinx and hieroglyphics being, being changed colors or taken off. You were not responsible for pages being ripped out of the Bible. You were not responsible to hold that stuff. But you are responsible to know the truth. You are responsible when the truth comes. For ignorance of the law does not allow you to give you to be absolved from it. This gentleman sent me was a Washington Post article where one of Robert E. Lee's uh, descendants was saying we were always taught that our ancestor didn't fight to protect slavery, he fought for Virginia. And what I want to do is just to read you the end of some comments from someone much more eloquent than me on this subject, W.E.B. Du Bois, written in 1928, on this topic, what was the Civil War fought about? And when people say, we were taught that he didn't fight, he wasn't fighting for slavery, he was fighting for the South. It is the punishment of the South that its Robert Lees and Jefferson Davises will always be tall, handsome, and well-born. Their courage will be physical, not moral. Their leadership will be weak compliance with public opinion and never costly and unswerving revolt for justice and right. It is ridiculous to excuse Robert Lee as the most formidable agency this nation ever raised to make... Now, he's talking about Robert E. Lee, which we'll get into. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a few more minutes here before I end it today. Stonewall Jackson, different ones that I'm going to allow to finish that, that portion today. But the same way that you are allowed to memorialize, that they want to memorialize the actions of individuals who were not as great as they made them out to be. It is the same way that they have allowed you to immortalize biblical characters that have not been verified as far as their greatness, their color, their true ethnicity, their true functionality. If they are able to memorialize or, icon, or make an icon out of Robert E. Lee, you have no idea. Stonewall Jackson, different ones, Christopher Columbus. And this is all in this diaspora of time. If they've done it now, then what do you think they did with the time that you have no knowledge or no transcripts from, including your Bible? I'm not trashing your Bible. I'm actually cleaning it up. Our scripture, I'm cleaning it up. Million human beings chattel instead of men and women. Either he knew what slavery meant when he helped maim and murder thousands in its defense, or he did not. If he did not, he was a fool. If he did, Robert E. Lee was a traitor, 
and a rebel, not a hero. I feel for the family of Robert E. Lee that's alive today, because this must be a really difficult time for them. This is the price you pay when you live a lie, when your view and understanding of history is based on a lie. Because when the truth comes to town, it really hurts when you're ripping that lie. This is the price you pay, church, for living a lie. See, he's talking about the story, historic value of Robert E. Lee and the families and the, and the, and the, and the descendants. And I, too, am talking about them. But church, this is the lie. This is, this is the price you pay for teaching lies that you know have been lies. This is the price that you pay for standing in that the standing pulpits. And that's where you wonder why I left. All of it is not a lie. But any time that anyone, I don't care who you are, pastor, clergy, I have all the same titles, all the same credentials, all of my walls, well, not on my walls. I I, I went through the same seminary and courses and and and, and have and have ascribed to the same understanding of doctrine. But the moment that you realize that what you know is not truth and you do not unpack it, for whatever reason you say, well, we must not over inundate the parishioner with too much information as to overwhelm them. You're not Yeshua. Well, I didn't, we, we don't want to tear down the only institution that we have. That's not the institution, keeping the institution intact, known as the church, when it's built on falsities and things that you know are not true, then that means that you are building upon the foundation that you know that must be torn down. What we are facing right now, this is the price you pay for living a lie. Oh, you can sneak your church doors open, but you know that there's a result that could be death based upon this current man-made or God-made or Yah-made pandemic. This is the price you pay. When people are exiting the buildings and, and having time to be brought to speed of truth like this, this is the price you pay. When 12, 13 bishops in one organization dies, like that, this is the price you pay for living a lie. At some point, the ancestral line must be chopped off so the truth can sprout up. You ever want to hear my understanding of the fig tree? Stay tuned. That's why the fig tree was cursed at the root. So that the truth, a new truth, the truth, can sprout up. Only a few more minutes. Ain't like you got anywhere to go. Off. So, Anniston, Alabama. I just want to give you a sense. When we talk about Confederate monuments, what are we talking about? And I'm just going to give you an idea. So in Anniston, Alabama, in 1905, they decided that they wanted to honor this man, John Pelham. And that is a statue or a picture of the monument of Mr. Pelham in Anniston, Alabama. This is word for word from the United States Civil War website, not a Confederate website. This is something put up by our government. And this is what it says. John Pelham fought with such valor and dedication for the Confederacy, giving his life in that cause, that he has become a symbolic of Alabama fighting men in all wars who have offered themselves to defend the state, the nation, and the principles in which they believed. Those principles are simply one thing, white supremacy and belief in slavery. This man resigned from West Point 
just a few weeks before he graduated so he could come back to Alabama and join the Confederacy. And I'm going to go back for just a second. Take the word Confederacy out of that statement and put the words Nazi army in and see how it reads. He was a genius at killing the enemy. In the Battle of Fredericksburg, he kept the entire Union forces in disarray by himself by firing artillery, running to the next piece of artillery, firing it, making the Union think that there were a large number of troops at their flank when they actually weren't. And it led Robert E. Lee to call him the gallant Pelham. This man died during the Civil War. He was an expert at killing the enemy, meaning American soldiers. And when you talk about the rhetoric that we have today about our military and about American soldiers and how, what we owe to the people who put their lives on the line, this man was slaughtering American soldiers. And they built a monument for him. Everybody remembers the Edmund Pettus Bridge and Bloody Sunday. Heck, they made a movie about it. But who was Edmund Pettus? Well, that's who Edmund Pettus was. The grand of the Alabama KKK. And that bridge was dedicated not in 1865 or 1870, but in 1940. And we'll come to that timing as we go through this because the timing of these monuments, I think, suggests something that's very important in terms of understanding what they're about. This is one of my favorites, I will just tell you. If you have, can I see a show of hands? People here who have been to Stone Mountain, Georgia. So there are some people, and I'm glad to see that. Uh, but I'm betting you don't know the entire story of Stone Mountain, Georgia. Because on Thanksgiving Eve in 1915, William Joseph Simmons took these things to Stone Mountain, Georgia. He took bricks where he made an altar. He took the American flag. He took the Holy Bible. He took an unsheathed sword. And he took a cross and he made himself the new imperial wizard of the KKK. That's what Stone Mountain, Georgia is. It is a monument to the KKK. Now, its history is interesting. That's what it looks like. It is the largest bas relief in the world. Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Thomas Stonewall Jackson. That's where we're going to end it today. <laughs> Jefferson, Stonewall, Lee. That monument is bigger than the bust that is in Washington on the Washington Monument. And these are individuals who lost in the Confederacy. I've seen this monument up close. I've been to Stone Mountain, Georgia, and I was, it was just the worst, I mean, it was the worst feeling. Just not even knowing where I was at, and I'm looking around, and I'm driving through Stone Mountain, Georgia. I got lost in the area, um, uh, going there for some business. And I end up driving through, and it just felt spiritually desolate and wicked. And so I'm driving through and I see this bust on there and I'm looking at the faces. I'm like, oh my goodness. Did you hear what he took with him? Recently, before I say that, before I let you go, recently a militia group, a black militia group uh, marched Recently, over the last several weeks, they marched to Stone Mountain, Georgia. And they were 
very sincere about their actions of being there with their with their assault rifles pinned to their bodies and very clear about what they were doing there they were angry because of what's going on in the country but I need you to understand that Stone Mountain Georgia is the monument to the KKK and it holds the symbolism and the values that this country started itself on. Well, I don't understand what he took. He took a burning cross, which you know this, you know the connection between the burning crosses and, and the KKK, but he also took a Bible. And he made a monument, bricks, a bayonet sword. And he made a monument. Understand that the KKK, the, the history of the KKK is not simply the hoods comes from the fact that they were literally wanting to invoke, to become invoke a spirit, the spirit of those who did the things, the dead individuals who did the things such as killing and maiming and destroying the Hebrew people. The reason why they have the cloaks on their face is not because they originally wanted to hide their faces, but they wanted to embody the dead of those who, are, who did what they are wanting to do. They were calling upon the spirits of the dead who did the deeds that now they would do. If you think that this is simply a ethnic matter and you think that learning the history is gonna be enough, you are far and highly mistaken. This is a spiritual matter that those who began this, you read in your own scripture that even when Yaakov, Jacob, Went from place to place, he 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 built an altar. The same way that this individual went to Stone Mountain. Now, now you'll find out later on that, and if you know the history of Stone Mountain, the project was actually stopped. They started building the monument. And I don't know if he gets into that or not, but they started building this this bust in 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 the side of the Stone Mountain. And if you if you see it, if you were ever there, if not. It is the most ominous looking thing ever. But they started building this monument. And then they stopped building the monument. If you see me looking down, it's because I have my oldest son in the studio with me. And because I want him at the feet of his father as his rabbi to teach him the truth. But they begin to build this monument and they stopped building this monument. And it was later picked up by the United States government. And I want you to do your own history and find out when it was finished. Just like the dates of these other uh, these other uh, statues, you'll find out they were very recent, like the 70s and even the 80s. Find out when they finished or finalized the bust. Find out when they finished building this thing. And find out how they finished paying for it. Find out, I'll give you a little hint, They, a coalition or a group came together. I, I can't remember the name of the coalition, the group that came together, but it was a bunch of people. Um, when you find the documents of those who gave were some of the greatest white people that you would never guess. And they gave until they were able to privately finish it in the very, very close or near past. But understand that he took a Bible, he did, and he, he, he created a spiritual act. If you try to go out through this process and only equate your process, this process, to understand the history, then you will be nothing more and then another group that's out there right now who are yelling and screaming that they are the Hebrews and they are this and they are that, and they will be filled with anger, never attaining the spiritual truth. This must be done in collaboration with history and epiphany. Epiphany and the universe.
I don't mean universe like in woo. I mean you must incorporate Yeshua's heaven in this understanding. This is the time that is supposed to be revealed. I think I am going to continue this tomorrow and I'll record it and um, do my own, do my own uh, more commentary to it. Won't do it live, but I will present it as live. I think I will do that later tomorrow. I want to see you tune in. Now, I'm also learning that people, I'm getting emails, and, and this is blessed. It's blessed I'm getting emails and things of people who are yanking the footage off of Facebook and YouTube. And I want you to do that. I want you just to go and to subscribe. It helps me to be able to know that people are paying attention to this. And even if people are not paying attention, paying attention to it, that's another thing. But it, I'm learning that people are yanking it off. And they are watching in groups and they're sending me emails and they're saying, hey, we watched this in this group and this and people. That's wonderful. But do me a favor. Tell those same people who watch in the group to subscribe. This isn't monetizing an account. I'm not monetizing this account. I'm not doing this for viewership. But it helps. As I am spending unpaid, countless hours delivering truth to me, from me to you. It just allows for the process to be what those who know me and know that I have coined the phrase, the principle of reciprocity. It allows me to know that, that there are people who are listening and it enga engages me to be challenged to deliver more and to do more. Understandably so. What you do in life, you want it to be understood and accepted. I have to continue whether it's accepted or understood or not, because my job is to bring understanding. But tell those people to subscribe. Go to the YouTube channel. Go to the Facebook channel. The reason why this is important is because what I'm going to end up doing is just we're going to be, end up taking all those subscribers and, and yanking them and giving them opportunity to be a part of this new network. I'm I'm concerned that once we flip the network, then people will be lost and not be able to find where we are because I'm not going to publicize it because that's just another way to get people to be able to shut things down. So in the meantime, and I won't even announce when it will happen, it will just happen. Kind of like Yeshua and his return, just like that. I'm just going to do it. And those who are part of the remnant will continue to receive. Until the next time, I bid you blessings, shalom, to the Yahweh, to the Yah of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, my Elohim, our Yeshua HaMashiach. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and being deceived and present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim be both majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. I bid you shalom.